on the Wednesday night, October 30th, 1996. We're in volume number two, covering the years 1922 to 1925. Of course, Lord Mayor here is the biography of the Avatar of the Age, Mayor Baba, by our dear brother Bal Kulshuri. So we uh, start on page 474. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Well, we'll probably finish it by the time I get back from the Why is it next week? Next week. Next week. Oh, I'm leaving the 20th. Really? I see. I'll be there. The book started at. We'll get there till the third, though. We don't get there till the third of December. We're going to travel. We're going to travel in the south of India. We're leaving the 20th of November for India. Oh, we're going to travel we're not going to a safari. Get to the to yeah, we're going down to uh, Travant, Travantrum and then Conchi. Oh, nice. Yeah, and then we're going to take a, a riverboat journey up. Uh, wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It <laughs> Coaching, you can take a car and go all down the coast of the Yeah, that's what we're going to do. There's a temple there. Exactly. We, we got this and book. When you write in the sand, you get three technicolors that red, black, and white. Sand. Wow. Oh, really? Thank you. Kanya Kumar. Kanya Kumar, exactly. Anyway. Page 474, Lord Nuhir, Volume 2. Remember and understand, Baba said, that during the course of my spiritual working, very often my cup of bliss overflows, and I desire to share it with the fortunate ones nearest at hand. February 2nd was the 38th day of Meher Baba's one meal a day fast. On this day, Gustaji did not keep Baba's food in the exact place, where he had been instructed. Baba became extremely vexed and threw the food away. He declared, I won't eat tonight because of Gustaji's carelessness. In the evening, Baba also refused his usual bath. Later, during night watch, he consoled Gustaji. It is not your fault. I wanted to fast for 36 hours. That is why this breeze occurred. After fasting for 39 hours, the next morning at 9 a.m. What does that mean? Yeah. That is why this breeze occurred. I guess this, this like this uh, spat, oh, this situation. Oh, it, was, it was like it was, it was like an ill wind that came in and then suddenly right. just. Oh. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it was it was a neutral thing. It wasn't oh. Gustaji. It was something that like. Um. After fasting for 39 hours, the next morning at 9 a.m., Baba drank a glass of fruit juice. Soon after, he wrote on the blackboard, From February 15, 1923, I have decided to remain only on liquids, such as tea, buttermilk, soda, etc. From February 11th to 15th, <laughs> bhajan singing will be performed. On February 15th, 500 people are to be fed and 100 poor to be clothed. No one. While conversing with the Mandali that same day, Meher Baba explained about the state of God realization and the perfect master and Messiah. Baba said, Realization is only one. The difference between the perfect masters, or Kitubs, and the Mazubs, was it? Majzubs, is that the former have the authority to use the power they have while the latter do not. That which is handed over by the perfect master to his charge man is not power, which is already in him, but the authority to use it. During his physical lifetime, the perfect master can do the greatest amount of universal work for the good of the world. After he leaves the body, he enjoys the power is with, with him. He cannot use it. For this reason, at the tomb or samadhi of a perfect master, there is spiritual power. But it is the faith of the people in the disembodied master which becomes the medium to utilize that power. It is for this reason that people derive benefits by revering a perfect master's tomb. But the benefit accruing from such sources 
and drawn upon by the individual's faith is invariably material in nature. Internal spiritual benefit can only be derived when the God-realized master is in the physical body. There have been some rare instances of people deriving spiritual benefit from the shrines of past masters or saints, but this spiritual benefit is derived only in special cases where the earthly connection of the receiver and the giver has been cut short by unavoidable circumstances. Such instances are very rare and far between. Material benefit from disembodied saints is more common and is in proportion to the faith of the receiver. There is nothing outside ourselves. Everything like planes and heavens and universes, earths, beings and things are all within us. The master gives the aspirant nothing that is not already latent in him. He is only instrumental in rousing the aspirant to the awareness of the divine treasure within him. He shows us the treasure that is already there. Duty, therefore, means authority. It is for this reason that a perfect master is ever eager and longs to give up this mortal body which prevents him from enjoying his eternal bliss. From the beginningless beginning, the Messiah or Avatar is the only perfect master who takes birth on this plane again and again, from age to age. The last perfect form of that being was Rasul e Khuda, Muhammad. Uh, uh, as Maulana Niaz Ahmed says, the name and characteristics of my friend in every age vary. His form changes, but the face is always one. <clears throat> ah, excuse me. The instance of Sai Baba of Shirdi in the Puta of Zar, Zari Bask, who bestowed realization upon Sai in Aru Ganba during the 1850s, it is an example of the of spiritual benefit from a perfect master centuries dead. During breakfast on February 4th, 1923, Meher Baba emphasized to Gustaji, if I fall ill and you find me senseless, or if I seem to be in a very dangerous condition, and even if I plead for relief, don't ever send for a doctor, Gustaji promised. The Buddha meeting was held every afternoon, and new topics were being raised daily. Excuse me, were raised daily. During that day, it was decided to enact a play for the Master's upcoming birthday. Arjun, Rustam, Asma, Zal, and Nervous were the stage cast, and they demonstrated their talents and amused all by imitating a bunch of drunkards. <laughs> Between 5 and 6 p.m., games were played. The game of Atiya okay. was to be played later. <laughs> That night, after Naval connected electric lights in the compound, at that time, Baba was in a fine mood. However, at 9 o'clock, when the game started, Baba appeared reserved, as if brooding about something. Though he seemed to be taking some interest in the game at the Apatia, that game had been in full swing for half an hour when Baba, while running at full force, collided with Babu Zakawala and fractured the toe of his left foot, suffering excruciating pain. Within a short time, his face turned pale, he sweated profusely, and afterward vomited. He alone knew why he was suffering such, as he, repeat, as he repeatedly uttered, I am dying, O oh God, I am dying. I wanted to do one thing, and the reverse has happened. The joyful atmosphere was thus turned into one of chaotic seriousness and anxious concern for Baba's welfare. While the Mandali were trying to alleviate his discomfort, he whispered several times to call for a physician or Vaidya, and a Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic doctor. Okay. 
in this critical situation and in the excitement of the moment, all, including Gustaji, whom Baba had particularly told that morning, forgot that the master had strictly prohibited calling a doctor under any circumstances. Rustam and Nervous immediately went in search of a bone specialist as others massaged Baba and placed cold towels on his forehead. Suddenly he started shivering and having spasms, as if he were naked in ice-cold winds. The spasm caused his limbs to continually vibrate. Despite his pain, Baba said, even my leg broken, it, even had my leg broken, it would not have mattered. It is in the inner shocks that are killing me. It is the inner shocks that are killing me and taking my breath away. Considering my physical state, after the fast, my body cannot bear these shocks. He then cryptically added, I knew this would happen. It is an aspect of my inner work, which, in spite of being spent in the desired direction, has rebounded and come back on me with such a terrible force. After an hour, the effect of the internal shocks lessened. Despite remedies, excuse me, different remedies had been tried to ease the pain in his toe. To prove that he was not suffering from the effect of the injury, Baba stood up and began walking around the compound without limping. Just then, a bone specialist arrived, but Baba refused to see him. The doctor was paid a 35 rupee fee, but was puzzled since he had not seen the patient. Rustam and Nervous had been frantic when they brought him to the man's hill, telling the doctor it was an emergency and to come immediately. <laughs> now he was told that everything was all right. Rustam <laughs> stammered that the patient felt much better and did not need any treatment. <laughs> the doctor responded, since I am already here and have been paid, it is better that I examine the injured person. Oh. The pain of the injury might lessen for a while, but then again it may flare up seriously. <laughs> And you yourself claimed that my presence here was most urgent. With difficulty, the embarrassed Rustam persuaded the doctor to leave. <laughs> Baba's foot was soaked in hot water, medicinal turmeric paste was applied, and the toe was bandaged. The tension in the manzel soon subsided as if nothing serious had happened. Baba then asked the Mandali, Can any of you guess what the meaning of this mishap is? Everyone expressed his own view, but no one's interference was correct. Baba afterward replied, you will, you will recall, excuse me, oh, right, right. Baba afterward revealed, you will recall what I have been frequently telling you about Asar being, un, being very unlucky and that he will either go mad or die some terrible death. All remembered while Baba explained, this injury and internal shock to me was really due to a sorrow. I tried intervening on his behalf, but the result is a failure. He is quite unfortunate compared with all of you. Within a week, you will hear something about this tragedy. Hmm. But then, Baba then confronted Rustam and Nervous. Why did you break my order? Why did you send for a doctor? Rustam protested. But Baba, you were in such terrible pain. You said you were dying. Baba retorted, even if I had died, you should not have disobeyed my instructions. <laughs> what, could, <laughs> what could the doctor have done for me anyway? My suffering was a result of my internal work for Asar. It is a question of obedience to my orders, that in no situation are they ever disobeyed. Only by executing my orders will you keep me pleased, and to keep me pleased is the highest service you can possibly render. Late that night, Ghani was gently pressing the master's feet, and Baba told him to retire at 1.30. Ghani wondered how he was to know when it was 1.30, as there was no clock in the room and he wasn't wearing a watch. Ghani was puzzled as to what to do. He thought if he didn't leave at 1.30, he would be breaking the order. But if he did leave, the sound of his departure would probably disturb Baba. After some time, Baba appeared to be sleeping, but suddenly turned over and asked what time it was. Ghani left to look at the clock and was greatly surprised that it was exactly 1.30. You, uh, who's still out of this one? I think he's got one now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then should have been. Give me a second.
during February, due to his strange eating habits, Mayor Baba suffered from constipation whenever he ate regularly. But since he had started his one meal a day fast, he was passing watery stools several times a day. The men who attended to him were besides themselves to understand how he could pass so many stools when his stomach was virtually empty. Although he was eating one solid bowel movements each day, his appearance too <laughs> would change from day to day. At times he looked weak and feeble, and at other times he appeared strong and active. One day Baba convened a session of the Guta and said, let us have a motto. All agreed this was needed. After a dozen suggestions and rejections by various men, Mayor Baba himself, on the inspiration of the moment, said it should be mastery in servitude. It was officially adopted as the motto of Manzi Le Min and later became the official seal of the Master's work. During the night of February 8th, Ghani was reading to the master from the book, The Life of Kaus Ali, a Mohammedan Kutu, who was a Kaus type ma perfect master like Sai Baba, and separated his physical body as an aspect of his spiritual working. If you recall, Sai Baba would sometimes be found with all his limbs separated right. in different parts. Yeah. That's a Kaus type of yes. bruises. This was uh, the life of Gauss Ali, who was another Mohammedan. I thought, I thought perfect message were more Kutu. together than that. Good one line again, wasn't it? Ah, uh, that's a good one, Rosalie. <laughs> they were putting something back together, Mom. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And now we're like in the wrong place. <laughs> Coming across that, what well, that would be well, so well, long, I guess. earlier in the Sai Baba chapter. Somebody looked into a hut where Sai Baba was. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> they saw his body yes. totally. Uh, yeah, you know, I never, did. I never just this Yeah, he had And the person was so shocked. <gasps> right. Yeah, they thought somebody had butchered, butchered him and cut him apart. Is that in here? What was that? It was on oh, Bonnie Moore. Bonnie Moore. Bonnie Moore. Sai Baba. Oh. And Sai Baba also used to sleep on a plank without any. Uh, Ladder or anything right. like that. He levitated to it. It was higher <laughs> up. <than that. laughs> and people wondered how he'd get up that high. <coughs> Anyhow, um, Ghani asked, uh, why did Kaus Ali Shah have to contact 19 different masters, 11 Mohammedans, and 8 Hindus prior to God realization? Why was it necessary for him to contact so many spiritual masters? Mir Baba replied, In actuality, God-realization is always given by only one master. But to gain normal consciousness and knowledge, it is sometimes necessary to contact other masters. It is also very often the case that the perfect master who realizes a person also brings him back to gross consciousness. In my case, Hazrat Baba John gave me God realization in a moment by kissing me on the forehead. But for worldly consciousness and knowledge, I had to spend seven years with Sadhguru Pasni Maharaj. During this period of my return to normal consciousness, I had connection with other perfect masters, and I contacted Narayan Maharaj, Dajudin Baba, and Sai Baba. Thus, if a master realizes or advances one, he is then entitled to be called one's Murshid, or Guru. Although, as far as realization is concerned, there is only one master. Hold on a second. So then, well, he, there Baba's Mujid, he's the one with all the knowledge and the power. Did I get that right? The, the one who gave yeah, you that's the what knowledge. He, I think that's what he said. They were his masters, but they gave him all the power. Is, yes. Is that, yeah, okay. Right. I just wanted to make sure. Right. 
it's if a master realizes yeah. or advances one, he is then entitled to be called one's murshid or guru, although as far as realization is concerned, there's only one master. We got that from Hazrat Baba Chan. This could be this murshida as an IB deuce of Sufism. And then there's a photograph on the next page of the Mohammedan Kutu, Tajuddin Baba of Nagpur, India, who was one of the five perfect masters of our age. When alive, Tajuddin was famous throughout central India, and today knowledge of him has spread as far as Pakistan. Mir Baba always referred to him as the Taj, the crown, and in turn, Tajuddin always referred to Baba, him, as the heavenly rose. Ghani then asked, why an authorization in writing known as sanad e vilayat is required prior to a saint's being put in charge of a spiritual jurisdiction? He cited the incident of the Mohammedan saint Ali Ahmad Sabir, who was ordered by his master to get the authority of his sainthood signed and endorsed by another master, Hazrat Jamal Hansvi. Prior to assuming his duty as the charge man of the city of Kalyar, Mir Baba gave this explanation. A signed letter or document is one of the ways of transferring the spiritual charge externally. During my last four months in Sakori, I myself had to take the charge from Upasni Maharaj in writing. The stamped paper and other agreements I have dictated and had executed from the Mandali, although not as important as the sanad e vilayat still are not without deep meaning and spiritual significance. The spiritual transfer of power and authority that takes place between a master and disciple must always be symbolized by giving it a concrete external form. Among Mohammedan walis and peers, such saints invariably give their chosen chargemen the robe of chargemanship in the form of some wearing apparel, like a cap, a turban, an apron, or some other tangible token. An example of the robe of chargemanship is the case of Sai Baba, who received his initial spiritual charge from the Hindu saint Gopal Rao, he received his master's dhoti skirt and sewed it into a kafni shirt and turban. So uh, I think Tracy uh, can continue. Tracy, why don't I start? Sure. In celebration of the festival of Maha Shivaratri, the Hindu Mandali from Pune were invited to Bombay on February 11th. During the Gutta meeting, Baba expressed concern about how they could accommodate their invited guest and, at the same time, prevent contamination, since there was plague in Pune. A lengthy discussion ensued on this point, and it was finally decided that the moment they arrived, they should be sent to the seashore for a bath and to wash their clothes. They would be admitted to the Manzil, but only after they had discarded all the fine gifts and food which they might have brought for Baba and the Mandali. However, when Sad Sadab Shiv Patel and Kah Sahib arrived at 8 o'clock that night, Baba ordered that hot water be poured over them. They were made to take a bath and compound with all their clothes on. Meanwhile, rehearsal for the play to be staged during the Master's birthday, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, created much merriment but too much confusion. Some of the men were overacting and some forgot their lines. Baba did not like it, and it was decided to cancel the play. <laughs> he's, a, he's a hard, harsh critic. <laughs> On the 11th of February, a new daily schedule came into effect in the Mandil. It was noted on the bulletin board. New schedule, from 9 to 11 a.m., playing of any game. 11 to 12 noon, lunch. 12 to 1 p.m., the gutter meeting. 11.30 to 3.30, any game. 6.30 to 7, dinner. 7 to 8 p.m., Bajan singing. 
The Pune Mandalay arrived the next morning and they were sent to Chopati Chopati? Chopati. Chopati Beach to bathe in the sea and wash their clothes. And upon the return, they were then permitted inside the Manzil building. On February 13th, a large pandal tent was erected over the backyard of the compound of the Maha Shivratri and Meher Baba's 29th birthday celebration. Vajan singing was held there at midnight. Baba, however, spent most of the time with Gani in the upper hall. Late in the night, while talked with Gani about esoteric matters, the master explained the difference between natural, unnatural, and supernatural principles. By acting according to the principles of nature and not going against it, the result arrived at it at is natural. But by not following the principles of nature and going against it, naturally the result is unnatural. By following the natural way, if the result proves unnatural, then that can be called supernatural. For example, it is natural to eat food by the mouth and pass excrement from the sperm, but it is supernatural to be eat by the mouth and not pass any stool. If, instead of feeding oneself by the mouth, one is fed through the rectum. It's <laughs> 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 not natural. <laughs> What did I just read? <laughs> you said it. You just read the master's word. <laughs> so where is this constipation coming? I know. <laughs> Obviously, these are, this is the chapter's back. constipation, you know, right? It's going to be the same of the meaning. But it is supernatural to eat by the mouth and not pass any stool. It's, it's, super, it's, it's supernatural to eat from the rear. It's, 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 it's unnatural. unnatural. It's unnatural. I think he's just trying to make a point. Yeah, those are two of them. Those are two of them. Those are two of them. Oh, 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 oh Violet. Oh, now we have another question. That's great. Why is it supernatural to eat by the mouth and not pass any stool? I mean, because, I mean can't you just be constant? Because well, that's, that's, no, that's the no, usual. You have to be totally still healthy. I mean, I'll tell you what. Um, Padre told me the story of Mohammed, the must, you know, the Arabic. He did not pass a stool for 13 months. Wow. Did he eat? He only was eating. Wow. And Padre yeah. said, finally, they said they had it, we drew it up the rectum, and they felt, they took, I, I think they almost took like a chisel or something. <laughs> sort of, really they, said, they said they broke out white, it was like white chalk that they took out. So it was, was calcified. It was like white chalk, he said, it was removed <laughs> to open up the, the rectum. But, but it, it was white, it was like just milk and the, the shikari formed like a white he never moved his bowels in 13 months. I would like to. That's, well, that's, 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 that's what we say. That is supernatural. That is what? That that's, is what? It, that's supernatural. supernatural. That's because he's really accumulating them. All he needed was an eraser of his white But I, I would like that to be confirmed again. You know who would confirm it? It would be uh, Heather uh, and Erico. Erico, yeah. Erico. Erico was there when that story was being. Back in the early seventies, I was amazed. Mohammed was sitting there with us. You know, probably we mm-hmm. try to coax him to do something. He says, and then finally he mentioned that Mohammed did this, and I went, "What?" And they said they were worried about it because mm-hmm. he has a stool and he's eating a bird. Kept eating every day. But no, but he, but he would only take <laughs> all he take with milk and chapati. Yeah, but still, yeah, that's yeah. that's solid food. But but we're but how do they know that he didn't? Yes, <laughs> I mean, Audrey was his kid. <laughs> well, well, I think Audrey told I, them to watch those guys. <laughs> they, yeah, yeah, they told I them mean, to watch he them. urinated, right? He must have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they just said stool. They were talking about stool. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I told him to watch well, that's stuff. a good <laughs> point. Though, that maybe that's <laughs> good. But, but, but Mohammed basically had a, 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 a <laughs> Jason, so, but, but he had an attendant that was apparently Heather or I mean, Erico or somebody else that that older man would uh, take him. Why older man? 
I knew there was an old little man that was that used to always hang out in Marvon. He died in the late seventies. But this is a while back. This is the this is mid seventies. Twenty years. So when I one of my first trips there, because I'll never forget, I was totally amazed by it. And Padre basically said, "Hey, Juan is not an ordinary human being. No, he's, right, he's, he's right. in fifth plane, you know." So. Right. So a lot of so these things that even Baba was suffering, the, yeah. uh, the dysentery when he was only eating milk, you know, the previous couple of pages. We'd have 12 bowel movements a day, and all he was doing was liquid diet, eating one solid meal a day. And the thing is, though, those bowel movements, most, most obviously, were probably just water. Yeah. It was water. He put twelve times a I mean, day. I mean, basically, was he, had, he was drinking uh, milk. Well, his his yeah. body obviously was just milk, soda, and that's well, what he was. Well, drinking. anything that Bobby's body would do, it was just a result of whatever his work. His work. I mean, so, so but, 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 it didn't have to make sense to us. That's usually the case. And, <laughs> right. Uh, and so what he says is what he says. He was giving an explanation. Right. He was just kind of giving an example of what supernatural would be. Maybe, you know. What is natural, what's unnatural. Right. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear pretty stuff. <laughs> you would hear what? Pretty nice things. Pretty nice things. Well, yeah. you know, he wants to see if you're awake. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. Okay. On the 15th of February, a search was made throughout Bombay for the blind and destitute. But this time, Baba's standard of poor was ge- was more general, and there was no great hardship involved in bringing the required number to Manzil. The feeding lasted until 4 p.m., and almost 800 people were fed. The men broke their fast of 24 hours at 9 that night, as ordered by the master. However, Baba did not break his fast and remained on buttermilk. The next morning, the Mandali who lived in Pune left for their homes along with Zayad Jamadar, who had been saying, in the meanwhile, a Muslim named Malvi Abdul Wahid of Hyder, Hyderabad, Hyderabad arrived, Hyderabad, a friend, and stayed in the mosque at Dadar. 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 While he was meditating in the mosque, he saw a bright light issuing from the manzil. He immediately sensed that there must be a holy or divine personality inhabiting the building. The next day, when he sat in meditation, he again saw a still brighter light, and in its brilliance, he was able to read the words, Manzil Imim. It was on February 16th when Marvi could no longer remain passive to his vision. He came and stood outside the Manzil. He was in such a dazed state that he ended up standing on the sidewalk for the whole night without speaking to anyone. The next morning, the master noticed a stranger outside. He sent Kustaji to inquire about the reason for a silent sentry by their gate. Malvi narrated a story about the light he experienced in the mosque and added that he felt profound peace within himself near the manzil. By Baba's order, Malvi was directed to Munshi Rahim's house, where he was given food and informed about who Mir Baba was. After dinner, a meeting of the gutta was called. And Mandali asked, Why is it that we always hear of outsiders at the Malvi today, having great experiences of your divinity and seeing brilliant lights, and we, who you say are members of your circle, are left in the dark? To appease them, Baba gave a brief but convincing explanation. What happens when you place a kerosene lamp on the floor? It shows light all around, but the area which is closest to it encircling its base is always dark. So it is with you who are closest to me. What is the use of all these great experiences in seeing of light? One day I will give you the real light, and you will be out of the darkness forever. Wouldn't you rather have that? Did you want to go on? It's just like in an yeah. eclipse. The, the center of the yeah. sun gets dark, but you see the aura around yeah. it. Yeah. Closest to you. That's nice. See, that's a nicer uh, explanation. <laughs> <laughs> nice and pretty, see? It's for you, see? <laughs> Later in February, his mother Shireen, his aunt Daula, Daulat Jayarani, and her sister Frani, his cousin Nadja, and Gulmai Kayarani came to Bombay for his birthday celebration. <clears throat> The ladies' lodging arrangement was made on the top floor of the manzil. 
Baba vacated his room for them and stayed downstairs with the mandali. In the evening, finding the food, finding the food Aunt Daula had cooked unsatisfactory, Baba became extremely annoyed. He ordered all the jars of pickled and tasty edibles she had brought to the mandil to be thrown into the sea. <laughs> Aunt Dala had prepared rava with fried ra raisins, almonds, and pure ghee. And she had even borrowed the money to prepare all these delicacies. Hers was not a serious mistake, but she, nevertheless, fell prey to her nephew's divine wrath. In a short time, deadly silence reigned in the manzil except for Baba's roaring and rapid strides back and forth throughout the house. The women and men disappeared in fright, hiding behind the locked doors of their rooms. Wow, like a lion pacing. Huh? Meher Baba was stalking about like a tiger. Despite his having fasted for so many days, his extraordinary strength greatly amazed the Mandali, especially since he was suffering from dysentery. He finally picked up a flower pot and hurled it at his aunt. Frightened, the plump, <laughs> the plump woman ran and climbed over the veranda just as the flower pot crashed into the railing. <laughs> <laughs> Barely missing her. <laughs> well, I missed the first part of that. What was she doing that he didn't like? He didn't Lunching like her cooking. Food. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any guests. You know what I like about this, though? I think it's healthy to be honest. It is. That's I mean, true. That's what Baba stressed, honesty and sincerity. Well, I mean, I remember my friend and his girlfriend. He would sometimes get on her case about something she did and cook something right yeah. and I'd be there and at times I feel so sorry for her but then I saw him and after it was over it was over he didn't harbor anything he would just say you know this is no good you know I can't handle it you know was, I just don't want it and she'd cry or something and I thought he was cruel but now I'm thinking but well, maybe he doesn't have the same charm and, <laughs> and, and status as Baba of course but but at the same time, he was honest. He didn't try to say, oh, I'll say to her it's good. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, did, I mean, he, I mean, he end, did he end up cooking? <laughs> he no, well, he was a good cook himself. Oh. Using tact or being tact. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, he nice didn't, way to tell people. There are nicer ways, yeah. Well, some people you can't be that nice with. Well, the thing is, he did a few <laughs> glasses of wine at him, and he just, <laughs> <laughs> he unfortunately could not control his... Uh, you know, what he'd say. <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyway, okay. Anyway, go ahead. That's beautiful, though. Okay. Where am I here? Okay. Frightened. Frightened, the plump woman ran and climbed over the veranda just as the flower pot crashed oh, into the railing, barely missing her. Dowla was short and stout. It was amazing to see her climb the railing and leap to the ground. <laughs> Seeing this humorous sight, Baba's mood changed almost as suddenly as it had begun. <laughs> oh, that's fun. The situation soon calmed down. In a tranquil mood, he began smiling and talking lo lovingly with Daula and the other women, as if nothing had occurred a few minutes before. But there had been a reason for the master's outburst. On the day he fractured his toe, he had told the Mandali about Asar Saheb, saying how unlucky he was and that the news of his tragic situation would reach them within a week. This foretelling of misfortune came true when on the same day they received a letter from Asar. Despite his promise, 
Asar had written to Meher Baba saying he was leaving him as he desired another connection, implying another guru. It is possible that Meher Baba's outward expression of anger towards Dala was act really for Asar's benefit. However, she was fortunate to have withstood the Master's wrath. Soon after, Rustam, Shireen's brother, was sent to the bazaar, and everything for the birthday celebration was cooked again by Daula. Meher Baba's birthday was anticipated with great excitement and joy. The festivities were scheduled for February 19th. As the day dawned, many invited guests began pouring into the manzil. The atmosphere was full of happy animation. Naval decorated the manzil, its compound and the pandal. Flower pots were arranged and young saplings beautified the grounds. Veils of flowers were hung around the house and for the master a special velvet sofa was brought and splendidly decorated by Manchi. The scene was quite lovely and breezes swung the garlands of flowers, wafting their fragrance throughout the Manzil compound. When Baba was requested to occupy, however, he refused on several pretexts. After great beseeching, he entered the pandal, but sat down on the floor, where he was profusely garlanded. A mound of sweet-smelling flowers was laid before him. Despite Baba's unwillingness, his friends, relatives, and admirers showered him with um, varied beautiful gifts, which he distributed among the people present. In the evening, Manchi approached the master with the hope that he would occupy the sofa if he insisted. But Baba remained adamant, and Manchi had to be content with garlanding him where he sat. The evening brought more guests from Pune, including Usman Khan, Abdullah Harun Jafar, Abdur Rahman, Ghani's younger brother, Elim, and approximately 200 other pe persons. Wow. Baba ate with everyone seated on the floor under the pandal. The lunch and dinner were exceptionally delicious, and this time Daula's cooking was complimented by Baba. After dinner, a Kowali program began. Three singers had been called, but only one, Yasin, sang until the last, pleasing Baba and all with and all with his touching renditions. This program lasted until four thirty in the morning. See that's where I would that's that's where I belong. <laughs> you know, can you imagine Kowali singing oh. all night? Mm. This program lasted until four thirty in the morning and all heartily enjoyed it in Meher Baba's radiant presence. The next day, Meher Baba had a private meeting with Daulat Jayarani, Gulmai Kayarani, and her son Rustam. Baba asked Daulat, Are you willing to marry your daughter Freni to Rustam? Daulat agreed, as this arrangement had been planned for some months. That afternoon, Baba betrothed Rustam and Freni, who had also come for the birthday in Manzili Mim, which gave great pleasure to their mothers. Later, Baba remarked, after Rustam's wedding, I am thinking of moving to some village for a while. Gulmai then asked, why don't you come and visit our property near Arangawan village, outside Amanagar? Baba coyly asked her, why do you say that? Gulmai replied, your visit has been foretold by a local saint, Galori Shah. Baba, pretending not to follow, said that he did not understand what she meant. 
Bulmai then told this story. A few years ago, my husband, Kaikushru, secured a contract to supply incandescent lights to the military barracks located near the village of Arangawan. It is six miles from Amanagar, and he used to visit there occasionally on business. At the end of World War I, a man bought the entire establishment from the military. Since the land was unsuitable for cultivation, it was in turn offered for sale, but no one was interested in buying such fallow land. As a result, the owner approached Kaikushru, who consulted his business partners, but they too were uninterested in buying what they called jungle land. He asked my opinion, and I wondered what we would do with it, since we would never be able to move there because it was too far away from the city. Nevertheless, he bought the land on his own, thinking it might prove useful in the future. The few buildings remained unattended for a long time and became dilapidated. Any of the villagers. Occasionally, we used to visit the place because Kaikushru had hired the headman of the village to sow millet there. A Mohammedan saint named Hazrat Maula Gilori Shah lives in Armanagar. He occasionally comes to our house for a meal, but usually he prefers to keep aloof. He dislikes the presence of any crowd. When Masaji was working in Amanagar, he used to take bread and butter to the saint and sometimes would bathe him. Galori Shah would often mention that he wanted to go to Arangawan and live his last days there. I thought that it was an unsuitable place for such a personage and would argue, but Hazrat, who will bring your meals there and who will look after you in the jungle? He would frown, saying, all of these people are of no use to me and I, I do not require their help. There were some wealthy butchers who used to pay him respect and who offered him some land. However, he preferred our place and would tell them that he would only settle at Erangowan. One day he told me, give me a small portion of your land and build a room for me. On another occasion, he said, take me there and also bring Upasni Maharaj and Meher Baba. Turn the place into a sadhu kana, an ashram for wandering medic mendicants and pilgrims. I would listen to him but tried to dissuade him, knowing it would cause an uproar among our in-laws. Uh, one night I dreamed that I was seated in the garden compound of a small old house a child all wrapped in cloth was on my lap. A couple of persons were speaking to me as my eyes gazed downward. I saw the head of the child peeping out from under its covering. The child then sat up, and I saw that he had the face of the saint. I cried out, This child is Hazrat Galori Shah. He sweetly pleaded, Mother, you are not giving me the land. Where will I rest? I instantly remembered the land at Erangowan and promised him, Yes, Hazrat, I will give it to you. The moment I finished speaking, I awakened. I narrated the dream to my husband, telling him that the saint had been insisting on the land for some years, and Kaikushru promised to fulfill his request. <clears throat> that very day, Galori Shah accompanied by some of his devotees, went to Erangowan. There he selected a small plot of land and told them, prepare my tomb here. This statement surprised them and they pleaded, but Hazrat, who will come so far from the city to pay homage here? This is a desolate place and uninhabitable. 
The saint then reprimanded them. You are like children. You know nothing. In a short time, this place will turn into a garden of pilgrimage. A great one will come here, and this land will one day belong to the people of the world. Only then will you understand why I am buried here. One day I went with the saint to look at the site he had selected. A mason joined us, and the plot was measured, and changes were made as directed by him. Then the saint turned to me and said, When I die, bring me here, escorted by a band. Bury me at this place. So that's that little tomb there? That right. Wow. Uh, right there. On the way up to the hill, just yeah. before you cross the road. Yeah. Well. Yeah, right there. I pleaded, your Mohammedan followers will never permit the band. He replied, yes, I know that. No way to do as I tell you. <laughs> tell them that I had no caste or creed. Then he concluded, Meher Baba will soon come here. And before he does, you should have all that will happen will be exactly as I am telling you. I promised him accordingly. Meher Baba was glad to hear this story and did not object to Gulmai carrying out the saint's wishes. Gulmai then inquired when he would come to Arangawan. Baba grinned as he replied, I may or may not come. You will have to come, said Gulmai. We'll see. Meanwhile, construct Galori Shah's tomb as he wishes, he replied. Externally, this was how Meher Baba worked. His inner work was continual and manifested in a natural sequence of events. No one knew that, while residing in the Manzil, he was preparing the ground for his next abode. It was only to light during, it only came to light during this conversation with Gulmai. Who knows what impact the avatar has in world affairs? It is literally true that not a thing happens without his will. It was already foretold by the saint that Baba would come to Mirabal. In a dream to go to Adi's mother. <sighs> Meher Baba sent the guests away the day after his birthday celebration. He remarked to the Mandali, Yesterday I watched all of you eat too much. The rich food should be properly digested, or else you will fall sick. All cringed at the thought of another march, and Ahmed Khan was anxiously waiting for the master to signal the order. Instead, Baba said, There is only one cure that will help. Today, we must all laugh a lot. Oh, <laughs> Hearty laughter will digest the food. <laughs> all were delighted at this novel suggestion. <laughs> and many humorous anecdotes were told. Baba, too, shared in the jokes and made the Mandali laugh. Wow. Oh, that's great. During the afternoon of February 20th, the following appeared on the notice board. From 12 noon to 2 p.m. daily, it is the time now fixed for my eating and drinking. In this way, the fast of 24 hours will continue for days and days together. Marijuana. But the very next day, Mir Baba changed the time from the afternoon to the evening hours from 7 to 9 p.m. He stated that he would only eat and drink water between these two hours, and that added that from 9 p.m. until 7 p.m. of the following day, he would not drink or eat anything. Mihir Baba again wanted to welcome the destitute from the streets of, to the Manzil. On February 23rd, 200 poor, cripple or blind persons were fed, and 50 of these were given clothes. Baba would daily impress on the Mandali about complete obedience to his orders, and daily find fault with someone. In the first days of the Manzil, he would cryptically say, By making you eat ghee and wearing a coat and pants, I will realize you. This meant that despite giving them all the comforts of the world, 
he would still bestow God-realization upon them. But by the closing days of the Manzil, the Mandali felt dissatisfied with good food and clothes. Realization was far from actuality. Their experience in Manzali Meem was only the beginning of their discipleship, and they had no idea of the hardships which they would have to undergo in the near future. Aunt Dawla had recently visited Upasni Maharaj at Sikori. On February 24th, she narrated before Baba and the Mandali what she had witnessed there. Maharaj has become very weak, imprisoned in a small bamboo cage. He has not left that cage once in three months, remaining seated inside it. He is often heard repeating Merwan's name. He seems to long to see Merwan. Gulmai K. Irani had also been to Sikori recently, and she revealed that Maharaj had complained to her, Why did Merwan drag me into trouble? It is not good. I don't want people to know of me. He also complained about those at Sikori. Tell them to stop performing arti before me. I don't want to be worshipped, and I am planning to take samadhi in this pinj pinjra or cage and die. Distressed, Gulmai inquired, What is the purpose of your sitting in this cage? Angrily, Maharaj replied, It is on account of you and on account of the whole world. What do you expect? What does the world expect from me? When one's eyesight becomes weak, one has to wear spectacles. So when I am unable to do anything for the good of the world, I have to do this. Gulmai then pleaded, How long will you remain in this cage? Maharaja cryptically responded, Still there is time. When I do come out, I shall either leave Sikori or leave this body. Hearing these stories, Meher Baba remained quiet for quite a while and then spoke this also seemingly cryptic sentence. It is better to die than to live, better to fear than to die, better to fill than to fear, and better to do or make than to fill. The Mandali were at a loss to understand these words, and the Master explained them in his own inimitable way. To die does not mean the ordinary death of the body but the real death of the ego, that is, to die before death, which amounts to becoming one with God. To fear is not to be taken literally. To fear means to be in the state of one created, in spite of realizing oneself as the creator or God. This is the state of a normal conscious perfect master, which is more difficult to attain and spiritually superior to that of a mazub, majub, one who is one who remains eternally immersed in the ocean of divinity, intoxicated continuously. To fill means to fill the hearts of people with the wine of divine knowledge. To do or make is the highest possible attainment. It means to make others perfect like yourself. To do for others what you have done for yourself. To make them like yourself in terms of power, knowledge, authority, and duty. This is the most supreme state, the state of being a perfect master. The meaning of my words is that it is better to be one with God than to lead a worldly life, better to return to normal consciousness after union with God than to remain divinely absorbed, better to fill the hearts of others with divine love than to remain indifferent to humanity, and better to make others one with God than merely to fill their hearts with love. More news about Upasni Maharaja's condition came from Sikori. Shireen had been visiting in Bombay, and on February 25th, she was sent by her son to Sikori to inquire about Maharaj on his behalf. Shireen returned on the 27th, and on Meher Baba's wish, gave the Mandali an account of her encounter. When I went near Maharaj's cage in Sikori, he slapped me. <laughs> Maharaj put out his hands from behind the bars, and catching me with one hand, severely slapped me with the other. My bangles were broken. Not being accustomed to such harsh treatment, I was very upset and immediately prepared to leave Sikori. But I was detained for a day, during which Maharaja called me to him four times. He not only abused me each time, but shouted against Merwan and some of you men. Warningly, he said, Your son Merwan pretends that he is a Sadguru. He is impersonating a guru. Hmm. Gulmai then narrated that Maharaj also had warned her 
don't go to Merwan anymore. He will misguide you. You will wither like a tree afflicted by disease. And consequently, in the end, you will have to come to me. For your sake, stay away from him. Hearing this, Baba asked Amandali, What is your understanding of this? Only a few days back, Maharaja had spoken quite well about me to Daula and expressed his love for me. They replied that Baba had hinted about it since their stay at the Manzil. He then smiled and said, I started this game. I wrote to Maharaj that I had no connection, Durgabai or anyone else at Sikori, and it was I who sent my mother to him. Because of this letter, he has now taken the step which he should have taken long ago. Now that I have started this game, it will not end with me. It is in Maharaja's hands. I have been continually telling you that Maharaj and the whole world will turn against me, and this is only the beginning, so be prepared. Everything will take a turn, just as I said it would. He then softly concluded in a cryptic manner. April is approaching after a gap of a year. After dinner, Meher Baba directed Adi K. Irani to write the following message to Upasni Maharaj. Meher Baba did not at all like your remarks to his mother, made in the presence of others at Sikori. He is now fed up with his duty, the burden of the work, and wants to abandon it. The letter was read out before the Mandali, and Baba said, Be cautious and do not misunderstand what is now occurring between Maharaja and me, or be taken in by the situation of our exchanging harsh words. Adi then promptly posted the letter. Bauji, in a poetic manner, writes, A secret game was being played. Only the masters knew what it meant and what the consequences were. There's a picture here of uh, Upazni yeah. inside his bamboo cage at Sikori during 1923. Wow. He's actually yeah. very majestic, very majestic yeah. looking, isn't he? It's almost like he's withdrawn. Exactly, yeah. very much. <laughs> Oh, what is that? Oh, <laughs> excuse me. Oops. Meher Baba became anxious about his letter to Yupazi Mahara. He decided to send Rustin K. Arani to Sakori the next day to deliver in person the message and to receive Mahara's reply. After his return mm -hmm. to the Manzil, Rustam reported, I reached Sakori on the evening of March 1st and took Maharaj Darshan. He talked to me civilly as he had in the past. Since the day he caged himself, he has ordered the ringing of the temple bells all day and night. The next morning at 4 o'clock, during the absence of his devotees, I was requested, requested to ring the bells continuously for two hours. Later, when I went for Maharaj Darshan, I found him in a changed mood. In a subtle manner, Maharaj then began speaking against Baba and the Mandali. On my next step near the cage, Maharaj rebuked me and vehemently abused Baba and the Mandali. I immediately retreated. Before returning to Bombay, I went to him for the last time, and he exploded in fury. He looked extremely angry, and while vituperating, sent this message for the Mandali. <laughs> you don't need to that mean swearing? Yeah, <laughs> in the least. Very strong word, actually. Yeah. It's a, what's the word again? Yeah, vituperating. Wow, I've never heard that word before. Like oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, major. Swearing. <laughs> right. Let everyone go his own way. Merwan is not a sat purush, perfect man, and I am no longer responsible for him in any way. He is a fake. <laughs> After this outburst, I asked Maharaj, how is your spiritual work connected with these pieces of bamboo, the cage? I admit that your self-imposed imprisonment is for our sake, but we do not like to see you suffering and would rather see you out and free. Maharaj then told me to break the cage bars. I immediately began struggling with the pieces of bamboo and broke one. This instantly made him more angry and he cursed at me. <laughs> Maharaj forbade me to touch it again and the carpenter was sent for to repair the damaged bar. He then softly asked me, why did you hurt my cage? I replied, you yourself told me to do so. Maharaj said, all right, 
Now will you do what I want you to do? I replied, of course. He then told me, bring me that big stone, bring that big stone over here and strike it on my head with all your might. At this I, be I became frightened. Maharaj then stiffened ones of the Mandali. During this, the carpenter was repairing the cage. He continued cursing until I told him I was leaving for Bombay. Meherbaba then seriously asked the Mandali, Do you still want to stay with me to the end? You have heard what Maharaj has said. Even he has begun opposing me. Except for Ghani, except for Ghani all said they would hold to the promise that they had given and would not leave him under any circumstance. Ghani said that he would think it over and answer later. Baba warned the Mandali, stay with me under all circumstances and don't be influenced by either the, what Maharaj or Babajan says. It is likely that both may denounce me in public. But the Mandali should rest assured that both are my masters and the greatest living spiritual personalities of this age. This proclamation of mine stands without exception at any time in the future. Baba then turned to Ghani and inquired, have you thought it over? Ghani replied, I will be with you until the end. There is nothing to think about. I just wanted to tease you. At this reply, all burst in laughter. That's true. Where did you uh, right here. Can I just first. clarify something? Okay, who is Baba's dark side? Gustaji or Ghani? Gustaji. Gustaji, okay. So, but Ghani basically did make an overtone. He wanted to think about it. So basically, Baba was probably a little upset with that because all of the other Mansal members didn't say anything. They went along with Baba. They said, we'll stick by you. But Ghani said, let me think about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. After but fasting, he, what? No, but then Baba asked Ghani right again after, and then he said, have you thought it over? And he said, have you stayed with you too? Right. Oh, oh, I see. Ghani said that. Right. Oh, thank you. I thought. Okay. Oh, well, it's up to Rosemary. She can do You know what a posture he said? It's like a posture. He was always sitting there. And Rupa Guru is somebody who's always in a sitting position. Oh, asana is a yoga posture. So oh, so it means. Oh, it's, so his word was basically the way he was. Pasha I mean, his name. The, way the name, right? Sitting. His name was Maharaj. Means king. Raja so is sitting, king. sitting king. Well, he's king of the yogis. He's yoga to God. Uh. After fasting on one meal every twenty-four hours for two consecutive months, Mayor mm. Baba lengthened his fasting from thirty-six hours to forty-two hours. On the notice board during March second, nineteen twenty-three, the Mandali found this written. From now on, no one should purposely touch my body, Merwan. None of the men could understand why he had this message posted, and they discussed it among themselves. Hmm. During this period, Vishnu, don't us ask me to pronounce Rukar. that, what? Deo Rukar had been called to Bombay from Ahmednagar, where he had been sent to work after Baba had left Pune during May of 1922. While playing cricket in the morning of March 4th, there was a royal battle between him and Adi, who had deliberately struck Vishnu. That evening, Baba gathered all the men in the hall and asked Bayramji what the disturbance was during the game. Bayramji explained about the quarrel between Adi and Vishnu. Baba asked the Mandali, didn't Adi break one of the 28 orders? The majority, however, took Adi's side, reasoning that he was not to blame due to the excitement of the game. But Baba would not listen to them and severely corrected Adi in their presence. He humiliated Adi by scolding him terribly for breaking the order. Baba then angrily turned toward Vishnu and demanded, Repeat your confession in the presence of all. Some days before, when Vishnu was massaging the master's feet, he had had sexual thoughts and had immediately stopped. Vishnu had admitted this to Baba, but only after reading the latest notice. Vishnu had concluded that no action, physical or mental, ever remains hidden from the master. The Mandali then understood the meaning of their message, of that message, and Baba felt pleased at Vishnu's frank confession. 
Okay. Baba then told everyone to leave except Adi, whom he asked, Did you feel hurt at my insulting treatment? <clears throat> Adi replied that he felt very hurt. Baba comfort anymore. To pass through the phase of insults is very good for you. Making the guilty party pass through such trying ordeals is one of the ways of cleaning away the guilt of his action. Even the perfect master Ramakrishna once insulted his close disciple Vivekananda by telling him in a harsh derogatory tone to go away and never come back. But shortly afterward he had had him called back and consoled him. It is my love that has been the cause of humiliating you before the others. I treated Vishnu in the same way, yet he disregarded my insult and told the truth in their presence. Baba then embraced Adi. The next day a loud argument ensued between Baba and Gandhi over Gandhi's usual late sleeping. Baba insisted... <laughs> That's <laughs> 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 nerve to argue with Baba. It's always mischief. Because he was Baba's child. Baba insisted that he leave, but after Gandhi stubbornly refused to leave the Manzil, Baba asked him, Will you follow my orders from now on or follow your love for sleep? Gandhi smilingly said, I will follow your orders. Gee, I wonder why I'm reading this passage. <laughs> <laughs> is that sort of is close that to home, is interesting? <laughs> yeah, well. Is the awakener getting to you? <laughs> He's trying to tell me something. Gandhi also smiled and said, Baba also smiled, then said, Since you have slept for practically the whole day, you may do night duty until two o'clock. <laughs> Gandhi happily agreed. At times, after the evening Coffee meal, for fish. <laughs> <laughs> the mandal he would engage in writing poetry, but their poems usually had no meter or rhyme. On March 6th, while Baba was in the middle of composing a humorous poem, he suddenly said, I feel like using the toilet, but I don't wish to leave the subject incomplete. He then asked if anyone would stay by his side in the bathroom in order to write down his composition. <laughs> Gandhi and Adi agreed. Baba sat in the middle stall. Adi took the one to the right and Gandhi the one to, the, to his left. <laughs> Ramju, Faradun, and Asma stood outside. For half an hour, the muse of poetic inspiration was wooed in the seemingly unpoetic atmosphere. <laughs> A God conscious master never does anything without some purpose, and all enjoyed the humor of this peculiar situation. <laughs> the greatest penance one can do is to dance to every whim of the master. Accepting his whims is the highest type of devotion. That which is given and received in a moment's company of the master cannot be gained even by thousands of years of austerity and self-mortification. That's a quote, but he doesn't say words. Sai Baba of Shirdi once explained that he contacted his spiritual agents on the inner planes during his Lendi ceremony. <laughs> it is said that a perfect master or the avatar is doing work specifically on the gross level during the relieving of his bowels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Lendi, yeah. Exactly, procession. Procession, drums, horn, big flowers. By himself, and everybody wait for him to finish. <laughs> yeah. That's when he was coming back, is when Baba came to him in Parvati. I see. It's in the first. Do you know the story about how Baba was on the toilet for a long time and they went to see what was wrong, if something was wrong with him, like five hours or something? And he said, I'm pushing uh, China out, the Chinese out of India or something like that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we would sometimes sit there for hours and not have a movement, you know, and other people, disciples, would have to wait. Who, that Baba? Well, or the master. Or didn't somebody make a comment once we read where the stars and universes oh, yeah. Came out. were coming out of him? Yeah. Yeah, but he yeah. sees the whole, he saw the whole universe. Oh, but as, uh, yeah, exactly. When he was in his, to in his stool. Yeah. I guess you don't say neither a nor a lendy bit. Neither what? Neither a bar or no a lendy bit. <laughs> Sorry. That's a, I mean, the funny way. <laughs> this is a funny chapter. On March 7th, <laughs> wow. 1923, after almost three months of strict containment, Herr Baba went for a short outing to Munshi Rahim's house on Sharni Road. Sayed Sahib 
Sahib Saheb was staying there and for quite some time had been feeling very depressed. To cheer him up, he's not the one that was um, named, was thrown her. out. Who was the one that was thrown out because he had an affair? He had a, a liaison oh, yeah. with, the, with that a sweeper? last week we had that. No? no last week we covered that. But I'm just wondering if it was no, this guy. One guy was thrown out. Right. Well, anyway. Last week we covered it. Okay, we it can't I wonder if it was this year thrown out because they had... He, he had an affair yeah. with the sweet Not an affair, it's just a one-night stand. Yeah, one night stand. Yeah, one night stand. He had sexual relations with the sweeper woman. woman. He swept up. <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, I'm just oh, wondering wow. if, if this is the same guy and he went to say it. No, it was a different guy. It wasn't Sayed Sayed, it was somebody else. But Baba called him before him and... The guy admitted it. This is where we have to leave. He got left for a seat. He got left for a seat. Are you serious? Who you read this? I wasn't here, but I read it. Sayed, Sayed Sahib was staying there and for quite some time had been feeling very depressed. To cheer him up, Baba went to Munshi's by car with Adi Bey Ramji Gustaji Vajif Dar and Ramju. After staying for a few hours, they returned to the manzil to find three messengers from Upasni Maharaj waiting for them. Three of the Sadguru's main disciples, Yeshwant Rao, Gopal Rao, and Trimbak, had been said, sent by Upasni Maharaj to induce Mayor Baba to return to Sikori with them. However, Baba refused, and all their efforts to persuade him were in vain. In the end, they pleaded with him. If you do not accompany us, Durga Bai herself will be sent to bring you. Still, Mayor Baba would not budge, and the three disappointed men had to return to Sakori the next day without him. This was, it was Mabu, remember? Yes. Mabu. Remember we even said the name, Boo. Yeah, oh. Boo. He is a Boo. Not a Boo. Bupasmi Maharaj had sent them for this purpose, saying, Somehow bring Marwan to Sakori, or else he will soon stop eating even his one meal a day. The three men had tried their best to prevail upon him, even weeping and praying to him with folded hands, but Baba remained adamant. This was an invisible tug of war between the two masters, but at the same time it was also a medium of their universal work for establishing Mayor Baba's avatarhood in the world. After some days, Maharaj also sent his chief woman disciple, Durgabai, to Manzil Amin, but despite her plea, she was also unable to persuade Baba to come to Sikori. Anybody want to take over? Or? Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it was Mabu. Yeah. Mabu. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you stop, Esther? Uh, page, the beginning of page 496. The, the Just start. Yeah. Okay. The Pandal then, that was erected for Mayor Baba's birthday celebration, had not been, dis had not been dismantled, and on the 9th of March, it was again decorated to celebrate the engagement of Rustam Kai Kushru Irani and Fraini Jahangir Irani. Family members and dignitaries began arriving in the early morning, attired in their finest clothes, and the decorated manzil took on a festive appearance. Two hundred tables were elaborately spread for the serving of the royal feast. During the meal, a humorous incident occurred. By everyone's plate, there was a small dish containing a piece of soap, cut artistically to resemble an after-dinner mint. Oh, no. <laughs> this was meant for people to wash their hands after the meal. <laughs> Dinner was almost over when Abdul Rahman, Ghani's brother, popped the piece of soap into his mouth, <laughs> uh -oh. thinking it to be a piece of cheese. <laughs> He immediately spat it out and tried to pretend nothing had happened, but his misjudgment did not escape the notice of those at his table. Word of this amusing incident soon spread, causing laughter as soon as the story was repeated. When Baba came to know about it, he called, Don't you know how to behave? Why did you eat the bar soap? Embarrassed, Abdur nervously explained, sometimes at the end of feasts, there is a small piece of cheese or sweet served. I ate it thinking it to be cheese. <laughs> Soon after, to add further to Abdur Rahman's discomfort, Baba had the bell rung to gather the mandali 
and told them to read what he had written on the notice board. From today, Abdul should be called Cheese. <laughs> Merwan, March 9, 1923. All dispersed, but again the bell was sounded. When the mandali went up to Baba's room, he pointed to the notice board on which he had scribbled, Cheese is now changed to Barso. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was his name forever then. Yeah. Barso. Barso. You always hear it later on, Barso, Barso. and so and so. Yeah. So they will always refer to him as Barso. <laughs> That's funny. Someone else had suggested this variation and Baba had approved of it. There were now five men with official nicknames, Asthma, Baidul, Nervous, Slamson, and Barso. Oh. <laughs> what did Baidu? What does Baidu mean? Yeah. Well, there was uh, Jafra Badi, wasn't it? But what, what does Baidu mean? mean? I know that's a Persian name. <laughs> it explains it somewhere, but we'll and see. Slamson? Slamson was mean? a derivative of Samson. Mm-hmm. Oh, because he Slamson. was strong. There was Gostadji's brother. Slamson? Samson, and so to it. Slamson. They just. Asthma, you know, he had asthma and bar soap. Nervous was because he was nervous. In the afternoon, Yasin started singing Kawalis. He was so inspired, he continued until 10.30 p.m. Wish we could have got Raphael Rudd to play all night. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe he was quitting. That's the spirit. Yeah, really. Then all retired after thoroughly enjoying the engagement party. Baba called Franey and told her that he forbade her from returning to Sakori. So after this, she went to stay with Gulmai's sister in Parel until she was married. The betrothal of Rustam and Franey brought Daulat in very close connection with Baba, and she, in her love for him, surrendered everything to him. By his intervention, one of her daughters was now engaged, and her other daughter, Mehra, who was then staying in Sakori, was soon to merge with the sweet music of Meher Baba's divine voice. I wonder if that's the same Dalat that he threw the flower pot at. Possibly. That was his aunt. No, his aunt is a different one then. Dawla. Dawla. Different one. After the biography of Sadhguru Basni Maharaj was released to the public, critics were in an uproar against certain spiritual figures. On March 14th, more articles appeared in the Bombay newspaper slandering Mayor Baba. But amazingly, the more the opposition to ba- more that opposition to Baba spread, the more his name came into prominence. The Gujarati newspaper Insaf went so far as to print an appeal to public leaders to take drastic steps to rip to pieces the net of the corruptive and depraved trio, trio of Mir Baba, Baba Jan, and Upasni Maharaj. <clears throat> Baba, however, refused to let any of the Mandali defend him or his masters. Writing rebuffs to the newspaper editors was forbidden. Uh, During this period, the master would sometimes visit a local theater with the mandali, but he would rarely stay until the completion of the play. He went for his inner work, and as soon as that work was finished, whether it was during the middle of an act or not, he would stand up in the theater and promptly depart. The Mandali had no choice but to follow, abandoning their enjoyment and curiosity of how the play would end. But on the 19th of March, when he took the Mandali to see a comedy, he last curtain call, much to the surprise satisfaction of the Mandali. On March 24th, Ghani returned to Manzil Amin after a six-day visit to his home in Lonavla. However, he arrived late. Refusing to admit him in the building, Baba sent him this message. Undress and then stand on one foot in your underwear at the edge of the fountain. <laughs> oh, no. ah. Kani did so, little knowing that he, what was in store for him. Some of the mandalis sneaked behind him and threw buckets full of cold water on him. 
Ghani loudly yelled, Baba, save me from this frigid dowsing. I haven't disobeyed any of your orders. Help me. Baba heartily laughed at his plight and pardoned Ghani for being late, finally allowing him to enter. <laughs> On the 25th of March, for some unknown reason, Baba became furious with everyone and wanted to go away. The Mandali pleaded, If you leave, we will follow you. Baba seemed seriously disturbed. He remained lying down in the backyard for some time and then stood for an hour in the hot summer sun. He sent someone to fetch a Victoria horse-drawn carriage. Then he sent another for the same purpose and then yet another. Three Victorias arrived at the gate of the Manzil and the Mandali were confused about what to do. However, he did not go for a ride, but had the Victorias paid off. These are larger horse-drawn carriages than the ones you see in Pune. They're famous in Bombay for tourists. He then climbed over the compound wall and again laid down to rest. He remained outside for a long time, finally coming back inside and quietly going upstairs to his room. His actions were mysterious to those who witnessed them. Later that evening, Ghani did something in an unthinkable manner that displeased Baba, who sternly told him, If you wish, you can stay at home for two months or else stay here. But if you stay here, I will ignore you and have no connection with you. Ghani did not like either choice, but did not reply. Baba then told him, You may stay here with no other orders except the original seven, the general 28 orders, but you must not speak or write to me, otherwise you are free to do as you like. Sleep for 24 hours at a stretch. I have no objection. Later in the night, Baba forgave Ghani. However, Ghani still had no idea what he had done to warrant such treatment. During this period, although Mayor Baba had given the order that the Mandali should follow him wherever he went, it was understood that if he gave two orders, they should obey the first. Once in an irritated mood, Baba said he was leaving the Manzil and going to Sakori alone. The Mandali followed as he started to walk to Dadar Station. Baba looked back and demanded that they go back, but they proceeded to follow. Baba looked around again and said, Don't follow me, go back to the Manzil. But again they continued to follow him. This time he lovingly said, All right, we'll all go back. Thus acknowledging the fact that they were obeying his first order to follow him wherever he went. At Rustam's engagement party, Gulma again requested Mayor Baba to visit Ahmad Nagar, urging your stay in Arangao will be a great blessing to us. Your presence will sanctify not only Ahmad Nagar, but the entire area. At that time, Baba accepted Gulmai's invitation, but did not promise to stay permanently. We only got a couple of pages before this chapter, is I'd like to finish the chapter. Okay. You want me to continue? Yeah, please. Okay. Two weeks passed, Mayor Baba broached the topic of sending some of the Mandali away to their respective homes, saying, in a few days, they mean. After Rustam's marriage in May at Ahmad Nagar, I will stay at Arangal. This is the little village there. There I will remain, but in quite a different way. We'll have to face great hardships. The life in Arangao will be quite the reverse of what it is here, and those who remain with me will have to work like coolies. Khan equipped, in that, in that case you should call it Hairangao, hardship <laughs> village, instead of Arangao. <laughs> Gao means village. <laughs> Mayor Baba then explained that the connection of those whom he would send away would remain as it was at present, and he might call anyone back to him at any time in the future. Each man promised to remain faithful to him, 
those whom he had decided to send back to their homes received the following instructions. From among the seven special orders, continue to follow orders one, two, three, four, and seven. These orders were, number one, to follow to the letter the spiritual instructions given by me. Number two, number two, to keep or break the special connection with one other man or more than one from the group or otherwise that I order. Number three, to totally abstain for 12 months from alcoholic drinks or intoxicating substances as well as sexual intercourse except when allowed by me with your wife. Number four, to eat, drink, and dress in accordance with the other residents in the house, to avoid eating fish, meat, and eggs under any circumstances. And number seven was, under no circumstances to give up my company, even if one finds that the whole world turns against me, except when ordered to leave me. From among the 28 general orders, continue following 1, 9, 13, 14, 18, 19, and 25. These orders were, number one, baths should be taken daily. After a haircut, an extra bath is permitted. Number nine is, eating less than to your full satisfaction is strictly prohibited. Report the reason for your inability to eat despite hunger and also in the case of no appetite after accepting food. Number 13 is lies, abusive language, and ill feelings toward one another are not allowed to the extent of breaking my order. Number 14 is do not read books, newspapers, magazines, and anyone else's letters. Number 18 is, in order to avoid impure actions, do not touch anyone while having sexual thoughts. Avoid vulgar stories and other such topics of conversation. Number 19 is, do not touch any girl except your mother or sisters. Number 25, before going to sleep, cover your ears with a piece of cloth or put cotton in them. <laughs> I do that. I'm going to finish it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if you're just interested. I'm sure you just finish the chapter if you can. Okay. <clears throat> Despite Mira Baba's repeated warnings not to neglect his instructions, Kashinov, the laundryman, continued, continued to do so. Finally, Baba warned, Baba warned him, if you continue to break my orders, you will become a lover. I am deadly serious about this. I warn you for the last time not to disregard what I say. If you change your ways, you will turn into gold. But if you fail to follow my advice, you will definitely have to suffer leprosy. To who? Kashina, the Kashina? laundry man. The he was, Nubi, who used to come to pick up the clothes. He was not a manzo, man. No. He, he was, was just a cleaning. But he, he would he was disobey the, Baba. Yeah, he was the laundry man. He cleaned their clothes. Mm -hmm. He didn't live there then. Oh boy. He, he'd, he'd live outside, but he. Kashinath, nevertheless, neglected the master's personal attention. In spite of Baba's constant forgiveness for his mistakes and his final warning, too, he brushed the master's words aside. Baba then stopped asking him to do the laundry, and Kashinath foolishly thought Baba knew nothing about his continued mis misbehavior. He was secretly having sexual relations. Sometime later, after he lost contact with Baba, Tragedy befell Kashinath, and he suffered for his disobedience, as the master had foretold. Partitions made of gunny sacks have been installed in the manzil to make individual rooms for the mandali. But after the departure of most of the men, the partitions were taken down. Within a few days, the manzil was restored to its original condition. Still hey, remaining with Meher Baba. Huh? I just want to comment about the leprosy. Maybe, maybe that's kind of a general cause and effect thing. If somebody slipping well, around I, with. I mean, I don't know. I mean, no, why I, should just a laundry man? I mean, what orders wasn't he following? Maybe to not have sex with, or to not do the job right. He Baba's order. Baba had foretold that if he did that, he yeah, would get. Yeah, but what order? 
Yeah, it could be the order. Well, he right. had other. He had other orders. Might have been ordered to do the laundry a certain way, and he might have thought, "Well, maybe I don't want to do that." But job. I think it's not much to have. But, but, but what he did, though, he, he had sexual relations with the one, the woman's servant. Woman's yeah, servant. I'm just wondering if that just leads to leprosy. No, 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 no. 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 I think it's like just karma of it. I mean, have process. you ever been in a position in your life where you did something, either you did something to be great or you did something, or you didn't do it, it'd be what, it would be horrible if there was no in-between? You know, the situations in life sometimes come up like that. This stuff kind of reminds me of that. It's like either do it and you're like, you're, you're doing wonderful or you don't do it and then you're like, low is low. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? You've never been right. in these positions in life? This is a, that's basically, I think, what he's trying to